country club and the individual that designed it in uh, 1903 was Alex Finley and uh, he came to the United States from Montrose, Scotland in 1887 and was working on a ranch in Nebraska and he ends up designing a six hole golf course on the ranch because he was an avid golfer. Nobody in this country played the game back then and it was at uh, the Murchison Ranch in Nance, Nebraska and he got a few of the cowboys to play golf with him and he brought the golf club and golf balls when he came to Scotland and the uh, funny thing is uh, he had Buffalo Bill and Chief Sitting Bow as gifts to come and watch the game. He was trying to get the game started in America and everything. And the only comment Chief Sitting Bow said was, I can't believe my people lost their land to people that play a game like this. And he turned around and walked off. <laughs> so that's that's how the, he was introduced to the people here in our country. But he later ended up, after he worked on the ranch for several years, ended up working for Wright and Dixon Sporting Goods out of Austin. And George Wright and also A.G. Spalding had sporting goods. They were on the Boston Red Sox baseball team and both of them were Hall of Fame baseball players. And so now they're into the sporting goods and they're trying to build a game of golf to increase their sales. So uh, Alex was their designer for golf clubs and you had the one in the museum I brought. Right. And then uh, he designed 125 golf courses over a period of years throughout the United States. And then he traveled all over. He played over 2,700 golf courses around the world promoting golf. And uh, Did he, he start out designing a nine hole or is that? He like started with the nine holes. Okay. It was almost standard back in the early okay. 1900s. He started with Wright and Dixon in 1897. So uh, uh, back then there was very few 18 old golf courses, but the other thing was most of them were uh, sand greens because mm. grass was hard to grow and you've got to water them and everything. And if, when you got further from the East Coast and out into the Midwest area, you got drier, drier country. So the sand greens with oil mixed in with it were what was used and then your uh, uh, tea boxes also were sand sometimes and you didn't have wooden golf tees back then. What they did was they would uh, get a bucket of water and a sand box set at each box tee and you molded them with your hands and then some guy invented a, a tea mold that you just wet sand in and punch it out and it set it up and you just set your ball on it. That was for the wealthier golfers or more <laughs> serious golfers. But uh, that was a big difference back then and made a difference in the game. Plus your equipment, which had golf clubs compared to the high tech uh, materials they use today in making golf sure. clubs, your golf balls, uh, they just fly so much further than they uh, uh, did back then. But Alex came down and designed Fort Smith Country Club in 1903 and it opened in 1904. They didn't have a golf pro until 1906 and uh, Mr. King golf courses. So Alex designed golf courses, 125 or so throughout the uh, United States and the Bahamas and the first golf courses generally were at resorts down in Florida at the Bahamas and then later they spread out in, into uh, other parts of the United States. Fort Smith was the only place he designed in Arkansas and he designed one golf course in Guthrie, Oklahoma which used to be the state capital back originally right. mm -hmm. and that was the only two in this area he designed. But uh, in 1903, he came to Fort Smith, laid out the golf course, and it pretty much a simple thing back then. Just a matter of knowing distance and the ball's going to go and how to figure out how to do the uh, number of strokes per hole. 
So uh, they opened in 1904, and they didn't have a golf pro here until 1906, and uh, Leslie Brownlee came in from North Berwick, Scotland, was hired by Hard Kelly, that was on the committee for Fort Smith Country Club. And he stayed until about 1909. During that period of time, he designed Oklahoma City's golf course and one in Muskogee. And then he decided to move on to another profession, decided to get into medicine. And he contacted one of his friends from North Berwick, Al Kendall, asked him if he'd like to be a golf pro in the United States and come over. He had a job for him, and he said, sure. And so he came over and took over uh, from him. And he was here until 1917, from 1909 to 1917. And during that period of time, he taught a lot of golf and must have been an excellent teacher because the Fort Smith people were superior golfers to the ones in Oklahoma and Arkansas. In 1909, we had match play between uh, Muskogee Country Club that uh, Brownlee had designed and the one at uh, Fort Smith with Al Kendall. And another interesting thing was these golf pros that ended up in the United States, one of them ended up in Muskogee Country Club at the recommendation of uh, Brownlee, all came from North Berwick, Scotland, and all lived in the same block. Wow. They grew up together. So they were looking after each other's interests, and they must have been. And not too far apart either. Yeah. Uh, Muskogee and Fort yeah. Smith. To, yeah. And, and what's uh, interesting about <clears throat> Kendall, who must have been one heck of a golf instructor, because in uh, 1909, they decided to have a tournament between Muskogee Country Club and Fort Smith Country Club. And at that time, they had match play, they called it, where it wasn't your overall score, but if you won this hole, beat the guy on this hole, and you lost the other hole, then you all are even, and that's by the number of holes you win uh, in the round. And it makes it a little more interesting. You can have a high score, but if you win enough holes, uh, you can so still was it the same? Out. Did you still have a, a par? You still had yes. A they they look at par. I consider that too. But uh, it was mainly just uh, if you won the hole. And so what happened was Fort Smith Country Club won 52 <laughs> out of 58 matches. So Muskogee only won eight <laughs> matches. So you you imagine here's 52 matches. That's a lot of golfers mm -hmm. out there. That's a hundred golfers playing each other. And it was really a big thing back then. It's, it's a big bragging rights. Right. <laughs> and I have the uh, picture of the trophy. You, I think, seen the 1909 trophy that was missing from uh, Fort Smith Country Club out here that I donated to them. But they had a bronze trophy, and uh, I'll give you copies of that. Okay. But uh, so Al was around all through up to 1917, like in 1919, a couple of years after coming here, and he played in the U.S. Oakland. Uh, he was always down probably 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th down in that area, but he was good enough to compete with those golfers. And he stayed around Fort Smith Country Club until 1927, uh, and then he went from here to Tulsa. And, uh, was golf pro in Tulsa the rest of his career and uh, lived in Tulsa until he passed away. So golf to golf pretty quickly. I mean, that's a, a sport that by 1912, it's not very old. It's, you've got right. the tournaments. And, okay. Right. So it's, uh, it was really just kind of getting started. But Fort Smith seemed to be better than the other places with their instructions and uh, had to be the best because they end up playing Little Rock Country Club and you have a photo in your uh, archives here of the, a picture of the 1911 of the tournament between Little Rock and Fort Smith Country Club and Fort Smith won again. Now what's really neat is Little Rock Country Club started in 1899 so they've been going a few years ahead of 
Fort Smith, yet they come back and, and had the people to win. Now, one of the uh, golfers that won the first state amateur championship was from Fort Smith Country Club. And it was Alf Williams. And uh, that was 1908. And he beat all the, the golfers in Little Rock around the state, down in Little Rock at the first at a state amateur. So we had some pretty good people up here. And uh, when I was born, Alf Williams was way on up in his 70s or 80s, I, I guess. But, I always uh, looked at him. He came out to the, the golf course where my dad was, and he was, uh, they all were catered to him, and he was just a super nice gentleman. Uh, I really respected him. I thought of all the people around, he was probably the, what I would judge a southern gentleman mm -hmm. and really nice, nice person. Uh, but down north, like what would be Midland Boulevard now, it goes into a dead end. You had the golf pro's house and the groundskeeper's home out there. So they were living right on the course uh, next to it at that time. We had uh, in 1908 the first state championship in Little Rock, and Alf Williams from Fort Smith Country Club won the state amateur championship. So here we are with. Fort Smith kind of dominant in golf in for, a while. for Oklahoma yeah. and Arkansas. So that's uh, uh, interesting and shows somebody knew what they were doing out there and teaching these people. And Al got burned out, I guess, on golf and left it in 1917 for a while and went to work at the Goldman Hotel in Fort Smith. And then in 1922, he just got back into golf in Wichita Falls, Texas, and later he moved on to Denison, Texas as golf pro. And when he left, another Scotchman, but from St. Andrews, John Gatherin, came in in 1917. And that was the year my dad started as a caddy at Fort Smith Country Club. And John Gatherin, I guess my dad must have uh, really became kind of like a uh, son to him because he was teaching him everything. He ended up being the caddy master and later on the assistant golf pro. And John gave my dad his first golf clubs and this is one of them here in 1917. This is a uh, wooden driver and the wooden hickory shaft, which was a standard. What does it say on the top? It's got my my father's name oh. on there. And then there's a couple of unique clubs. And my dad went from assistant pro to a golf pro at, in Fort Smith at what was called Rolling Nose Country Club in 1932. This putter, he set five course records with in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And at age 17, he, with this putter, he set the course record at Fort Smith Country Club that they said would never be broken. And the next day he broke that. <laughs> so uh, they were amazed. And the, the newspaper articles I have a copy of. But this was his putter uh, that he set the course record for. It. And then a unique uh, club in this group. I'm going to get a golf ball out so you can kind of see it. This was called a giant nibbler. And you can see with a golf ball how big that blade is. And this is for getting out of sand traps and out of the rough and things. And this blade is, doesn't have a flange like the modern clubs have a wider base. So when you hit the ball in a sand trap I found trying to hit <laughs> with this. It's like you hit it and it just slices down into the sand and big water sand comes up the ball topples off. So you got it you can't hit it the same way you do the modern golf club. But this was just like a knife blade going into the sand. So I had to learn to use this. And I played with wood shaft clubs, that's the only thing I played with until I had to give up the game. But uh, 
So you initially figured out how to use that. Yeah. 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 This is another club I might pull out later. It's with another part of the, the story about the dog. And so, uh, anyway, my dad really took to the game and was very good at it. Uh, his problem was his temperament. He had a hot temper, and I refused to caddy for my dad because uh, clubs sometimes ended up in trees in the middle of the lake, and I didn't want to climb trees or swim out to get a golf club if he was having a bad day. And so I caddy for other pros, but I'm caddy for my dad. Okay. <laughs> and, and that worked out well for me. <laughs> but uh, John ended up uh, here until about 1927 or 26, and he ended up going over to Tulsa. But while he was a Fort Smith in 1919, he entered the... Uh, tournament in Oklahoma City, which is U.S. Open, which was considered a major golf tournament on the Pro Tour of that period, and he won it, so he was a good golfer, and he entered the U.S. Open several times, and would be in the top 10 or 15, so he was doing real well, and he ended up going to Muskogee, or not Muskogee, but Tulsa from here, and he stayed there the rest of his life, but, uh, in 1927 was when the Fort Smith Country Club sold to United Commercial Travelers and became UCT. And it stayed that until uh, 1955 when Pete Parker bought it and returned it back to Fort Smith Country Club again. But the uh, events that were held a couple of special things happened back in 1916. World War I was just kind of going, getting started, I think. And they had an exhibition match at Fort Smith Country Club between Chick Evans and Bob McDonald. Chick Evans was the 1916 U.S. Open and U.S. Amateur Champion that year. The only man in history to win both of those tournaments. And Bob McDonald was a Scottish golfer. And so they were playing Fort Smith, and my dad would end up caddying with Bob McDonald. And he said what was basic to him every time Bob hit a uh, drive with the driver, they'd get out to, to the uh, ball and look down and then have a flat side on the golf ball from the impact. He was so powerful. And of course, your golf balls were softer back then than they so were. So these are still the leather ones at that point. No, this okay. was, was this was the standard golf ball. Okay. The leather went out uh, in the eighteen uh, hundreds, oh, okay. and they came out with solid rubber. And then they were around until the early nineteen hundreds, and then they come in with wound rubber and get a little more yardage out of them, a little harder covers on them. But uh, the uh, Leather ball was around from the beginning all the way up into the uh, uh, 1870s and 80s. They started coming out with a solid rubber ball. And those were pretty hard. And they were generally black to begin with. And then they started painting them the white. And then, of course, they paint golf balls red for snow, playing in snow. I played in two foot of snow before. Uh, up in Kansas. Yeah, why you wouldn't find? <laughs> I was the only one on the golf course. I didn't, couldn't figure that out. <laughs> but anyway, here at Fort Smith, we had uh, that event, and it was for World War One. Was the Red Cross fundraiser because Red Cross had people working among the uh, uh, prisons in in the uh, German prison camps and things. And they would find people's relatives for you and contact and let you know. And they had a good good system that all countries allowed the Red Cross to come into their prisons and see the prisoners talk to them a little bit on a limited basis. So that was the way they were able to find out about their uh, soldiers that were overseas sometimes. So that was what they were raising funds for. 
And later on at Fort Smith Country Club, uh, around 1930, we had the great Babe Ruth playing with Tony Lazari. Tony was second baseman at Fort Smith. Yes, Tony was second baseman for uh, the Yankees, and he's a Hall of Famer. And Babe Ruth uh, come to visit him. Tony was staying at Fort Smith one summer or one winter, rather, because during the winter months the baseball players all went south out of New York. They'd go to Hot Springs and down in Georgia or Florida or looking for warmer climate, and they all played base. Uh, all the baseball players played golf. So Babe Ruth played for Fort Smith Country Club at least once with Tony, and then from here he went down to Hot Springs and played with uh, some more of his uh, golf and uh, baseball buddies in Hot Springs. And that also later became a summer camp. And uh, so those were some uh, important people who played Fort Smith Country Club back then. And then as you get up in the later years, Mickey Mantle was here in 1950. He was playing for the Joplin Miners his first year in the minor league. And he got married, and he didn't have any money to go any place for a honeymoon. And he contacted, he knew Grady Seacrest that was manager for Fort Smith Giants. For some reason, they had become friends. And uh, Grady told him, he says, I'll tell you what, if you'll come to Fort Smith, I'll pay you for a week's lodging and room and board here for your honeymoon. And so he says, okay. <laughs> so he ends up staying at Dennis Court. Really? Next to Fort Smith Country Club. And uh, Mickey told me himself when I was working with him on the Hall of Fame baseball tournament uh, that uh, he had come down here and stayed, and he and his bride would walk over and play golf every day and play around the golf at Fort Smith Country Club that whole week. And that was his only, he didn't have transportation to get around much. And uh, so that was his only form of uh, pleasure there, and getting around Fort Smith was at the golf course. What a great story. So that was kind of a, a neat thing. And uh, so I, I hadn't heard that until I talked to him. Then uh, in 1962, I was living in McAllister, Oklahoma, and I'd been involved, of course, with rodeo since 1948. And the Rodeo Association, I did public relations for them, and I was on the staff for the Rodeo Sports News that they was their official paper. And since I played golf and the uh, editor of the paper and was also kind of ran around the rodeo association's office, he says, why don't we get some golf tournaments going for these cowboys? I says, how many have we got out there playing? He says, not a whole lot right now, but we get more because they need something to do in the daytime. And most of the rodeos are evening or right. on Saturday or Sunday afternoons. So uh, I said, okay. And I thought, well, Fort Smith is close to me, and I know Fort Smith a little bit. I'll go over and talk to the rodeo committee and see if I can get them to kind of sponsor this. And all I needed was $50 to buy some trophies. And then I would go downtown to the merchants and see if I could get gift certificates for 5 or $10 or a shirt or a pair of jeans, just something small, just to give them a gift. But I said, now, I'm not going to handle any of this. I'll get to pick up some certificates and I'll give them to the uh, rodeo board and you're going to hold them for it. And I said, I don't want any part of anything. You just hand those out to the winners and let them go down and, and pick their own prizes up. That way, that'll be maybe some additional business for the local businessmen. And make them feel good that they'll meet the guy that they would want their gift certificate. So that uh, started in 1962, and we had the very first one, I run into a problem. I don't know where you remember an actor by the name of Ty Harden. 
play Brock on Lane on TV series. And Ty was their star for the rodeo here. It was entertaining. And I didn't know he was an avid golfer. And he shows up out at the golf, cowboy golf tournament. And I'm saying, this may not go real well with the, with the guys because none of them are all that good. Except one guy was Bill Federson that knew how to play golf pretty good. Bill was a saddle rock rider, bull rider. And so Bill was on our board of directors. And I says, Bill, we got a problem. I says, he's a member of the Rodeo Association as a contract act, but not a contestant. We kind of designed this for the contestants. What do you think about him playing? He says, well, let's, let's let him play. We don't want to cause any trouble here. Let's let him play. It might be a good promotion. They had his picture and everything on paper playing at the tournament. He turned up, he says, okay, he got up to, the, he was hitting golf balls. They go zooming off one way, zooming the other way. <laughs> Didn't look real great. And he got Bill up there watching. And he says, how about the bets on this? And he was going to play with Bill since he was most experienced. You know, at the tournament. And Bill says, okay. And he says, go ahead and tee off. And Bill's standing back there and wham, hit the ball straight down the middle as far as you can see. And Bill says, uh oh, I've been suckered. <laughs> so Bill ended up losing. But, but Ty said, I'm not here for any of the prizes or the trophies, anything. I just want to play golf with the guys. And he says, great, they liked it. And it turned out real well. Bill, went, when he was out on a California ride in the Los Angeles, Hollywood area, he'd call up Ty, he had his phone number, and they'd go out and play golf together. And he says, that guy treated me just like family. I really had a good time out there on the West Coast. So that all started in our little golf tournament at Fort Smith. And then when I went to the rodeo board to get this, I was told by Paul Turret that was president of the chamber. He says, you're going to have a split four to three. Homer Crane is going to be on, have three backers, and uh, R.K. Rogers will have four backers on his side. He says, so all you got to do is sell R.K. on the golf tournament. So I made an appointment to go talk to him. And he says, that sounds interesting. I like that idea. I says, it'll bring something different to the rodeo. It's not going on anyplace else yet. And so uh, when I went before the board, the vote was four to three. You <laughs> <laughs> picked the right side. I picked the right side, RK side one. And Homer says, I, no cowboy knows how to play golf. And I says, well, they can learn. This is something for them to do. I says, would you rather have them sitting in a beer joint getting drunk all day, or would you rather have them out doing something different, uh, you know, and everything? And then be, not even be able to ride that thing. He says, well, yeah, <laughs> sounds, sounds, sounds good. Okay. So uh, that, do, do they still play a lot of golf? The they rodeo? have a few of them, not, not a whole lot, but still have a few. So uh, what was real funny is the very first one in 1962 uh, because Ty Hart was playing in the tournament that had his picture and Bill Federson playing the Cowboy Golf Tournament Fort Smith, Arkansas, New York Times. And so here I had this, and I had a big story about it. And I had this story in, in New York Times and I went to Homer Crane and I says, <laughs> look at this Homer. He looks at that and he says, wow. I says, they didn't mention your rodeo, but we got Fort Smith on with the Cowboy Golf Tournament. <laughs> so I, I let him know that that was, <laughs> that was a key to get extra publicity. So maybe different things might be a good idea once in a while. So uh, and one of the guys that played in my golf tournament uh, wasn't real good, Carl Nashter. Carl uh, was a bull rider, and I just feel sorry for Carl because it seemed like every time he was thrown off a bull, he'd come down head first. <laughs> and 
thought, man, that guy gets that grand heart in that head. <laughs> but anyway, Carl made it up to uh, number three in the nation in bull riding uh, once. He was in the National Finals Rodeo several times. And so uh, Carl played in my golf tournament. And it, he ended up wearing, winning a trophy like fourth place, uh, in the fourth flight or something like that. He's one of the one of the last last deals, but we uh, had it fixed where everybody had a chance to win. So Carl won that thing, and so he ended up uh, after a few years he got his leg broken real bad and had to put a steel bar in there and he quit rodeo riding. And I lost track of him. And somebody said, "Oh, he's training horses." Well, I had several of the guys that trained horses. Uh, that rode rodeos and knew that and didn't think anything about it. But in 1990, I'm sitting in front of my TV watching the Kentucky Derby. The winning horse, unbridled trainer, Carl Nascar. I says, Carl? <laughs> and they showed his picture and I said, it is Carl. I can't yeah. believe this. I didn't know he, he was up into that status in training. So the next morning, I says, he's going to be so busy tonight and everything, he's no use calling. I call him the next morning, and he says, who's this again? I says, this Dusty Helmley, Cowboy Golf Tournament days. Oh, boy, yeah, I remember that. He says, you know i still got that golf trophy sitting on my shelf in my office. And he wanted to talk about the golf tournament, and I'm going to talk about it. he won the Kentucky Derby. And he's more excited about the golf trophy. Uh -huh. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and I said, something's wrong with this guy. <laughs> but uh, we chatted a while, and then he won again later on, I think in 1970, he won again. And I traced down his, his years of training. He had won first place more than 1,100 times in his career. Wow. A lot of second place, second place wins over a thousand. In third place, he was right up around 900. And I, I went on down and looked at the total winnings he had through his career. $52 million he had won since he left Rodeo. And I'm thinking, he made a good decision back then. <laughs> I really believe. And I've got a picture of him He's got a big smile on his face, and I says, I think I'd be smiling too if yeah. I'd been that well off. So that, that's another person we've had, two-time winner of Kentucky Derby. How about that? That's uh, played at Fort Smith Country Club. So, okay, this is a trophy that my dad won in 1929. He was an assistant golf pro, but he was playing in the PGA Regional or sectional, they call it, uh, golf tournament. And one of the players that, that won was the PJ's national first place winner. And my dad come in second to him. He was a, a big winner in 1930s, uh, uh, high money winner on the PGA tour and was for several years. So my father was second place and he was at that time, only an assistant pro. And this was the second place trophy from that sectional PGA tournament. This is a putter of Bob McDonald that in 1916 had played the exhibition match at Fort Smith Country Club with Chick Evans. And this is a, club, a putter that he had that my dad got after the, they played the exhibition match and had since 1960, well, yeah, 1916, when he was the caddy for him. And are these clubs that you've used over the years, or are these? I've used these, yes. Okay. I play with, uh, I, I got rid of all my good golf clubs. I had a, a custom made set from uh, St. Andrews, Scotland, Modern Clubs. And in 1985, I decided I'm going back to playing with the original wood chap clubs I played with when I was a kid and they would just cut them off shorter uh, what happened was my mother 
uh, would take me around with her. Every morning she played a practice round of golf and the caddy carried her bag and she pushed me in a baby stroller. <laughs> and then when I got to the green, they gave me a golf ball and a little putter. And she put the ball down a little further from the cup as I got older and put it in. And when I was four years old, she started letting me play a full nine hole golf wow. round with her. So she had a lot of patience with me hitting the ball down there. And, uh, well, you really did grow up with a golf club in your hand. Yeah, I've got pictures of, uh, when I was uh, two years old uh, with a, and what was comical, yeah, let's see, a bigger picture. Yeah, okay. This is the, uh, the picture here. I've got another one in oh. front of it. Okay, I was two years old and I was visiting my grandmother's and I had a ball play with, but I didn't have anything else. And here come this old fellow to visit my grandparents, had a cane. He walked up, sat down on the front porch, and he was sitting on the porch talking to them, and grandmother was in a swing, and grandfather was sitting down with him on the porch, and they were talking, and I was, of course, just a little kid, I didn't know what's going on. I went over, picked up the cane, and it looked like a golf club to me, so I started swinging and knocking the ball around the yard with the guys came and they got a big kick out of that. It was their entertainment. But that's what somebody got a snapshot of me and blew it up. Boy, isn't that something? And this now is, is this the cane or is this the golf club? This is the cane here. Okay, this is, the cane. This is a picture of me in uh, 1939. Yeah, 1939. Now this was an event that happened in another golf course, which are wrong knows, and I'll do a thing about that another time. But uh, this was taken of me because I'd had a hole in one on a 130 yard par three. And I was playing with caddies. They got all excited, but I didn't know what the excitement was because people had hole in ones off and on, and you'd see them, and uh, they were th no big deal, I didn't think. But I didn't think about me being a little kid having a hole in one was different than an adult. And later years, uh, another kid had a hole in one, and he was older than I was, and they had a big newspaper story, and then it got into golf magazines. And his was, I think, about 120 yards, and he was six years old. And it was making big news. And I thought, oh, I had that when I was five. <laughs> What's the big deal? So I contacted the Guinness Book of Records people. I said, I want to check this out. And I says, also, I'm seeing things going on. I want to want to warn you, you're going to have some problems here. I said, uh, I had a home one at age five on 130 yard part three and I have two witnesses, the caddies with me. I said, I couldn't see the cup because it was on an elevated green and it was across the creek and up on uh, the wow. hill. And I hit the ball and they rolled in. They, the caddies were 14, 16 year olds, they could see it. And I couldn't until I got up there and they said, go over and look in the hole. And sure enough, there was my ball. So uh, the Guinness people says they never kept records on, on kids everything but as far as they knew in 19, my hole in one 1939 was the first one in the history of golf by a five year old on a regulation golf course and How about that? you heard so, it here first mm -hmm. yeah, so uh I, I was telling them when i said okay now let me tell you about something uh, there's a guy in england who took his kid out and out to a practice screen and they stood out off the edge of the practice screen and he had golf balls for three days before I, one of them went in the cup and they're claiming a hole in one. I said, you're gonna to have to do some kind of a, uh, uh, specific rules on what qualifies for this because everybody's gonna be doing it now. Yeah. And saying their kids, this guy was selling shirts, his <laughs> youngest kid, he was four years old, had a hole in one in history. Well, yeah. There's opportunity there. <laughs> yeah. How many tries did he have? So that was uh, one of the things that uh, I thought was kind of surprising. And my father, uh, we're both recognized on a uh, 
walk of champions at the World Golf Hall of Fame in St. Petersburg, Florida. And my father was the only PGA hope, a pro in history to eagle the same hole four rounds in one day, consecutive rounds. And an eagle would be like if you're, it's a par four, he made it in two. Oh. And it was a par four, 350 something yards. And he drove the green and tapped it in the hole the first three times. And the fourth time he missed the green and he chipped it in the cup from off the green. And one of the guys from Fort Smith was in that group saw that was Bill Mosley, the late Bill Mosley. And he did make one comment about my dad that uh, uh, nobody else had ever said to me. And he said, I've watched uh, Nicholas and Arnold Palmer play golf. He says, your dad was better than both of those guys if he hadn't had that hot temper. <laughs> and I recall in a tournament in Texas, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm uh, just a little boy, about five or six years old, and my mother's standing there, he's winning this tournament. He hit the ball within about 18 inches of the cup, and he put it, and it rimmed out. The other golf pros and the caddies were going backwards off that green because they knew that putter was going one direction <laughs> or the other. They were getting out of line of fire. And my mother and I are sitting over there, everybody was real, real quiet. My dad's face just got real red. And he reached down, and we didn't know what he was going to do. He picked up the ball, threw it to the caddy, threw the club to the caddy. He says, anybody that misses an 18-inch putt and doesn't deserve a dime, he disqualified himself from the winnings and walks off the green, gets the car, we drove five hours home without a single word. And boy, was I wanting to go to the bathroom bath. <laughs> but I'm sure not going to say anything to my father <laughs> in that time of temperament. <laughs> I'd learned that long ago. Oh, wow. and so I, I made the trip in pain. <laughs> but uh, that was the problem. He could have been great, world famous, if he had not uh, had that problem of letting the temper get the best of him. Now, was golf a hobby your, most of your life, or did you go professional in any No, way? I never did go professional. I, I was good. They all thought I would, but I got more interest in rodeo than golf, and I, I just played golf for fun. And if we had an interesting round in 1980-something. My, my father quit golf completely in 1946. Hadn't hit a golf ball between 1946 and 1980 something. I don't remember, 81, two, three, long in there, maybe four. And my mother hadn't played in a long, and since uh, then. And I said, I would like for all three of us to go play around with golf together. One, one final round, all three of us, because when we haven't been able to do this before. And mother finally got dad talked into it. He didn't want to. We go out to Fort Smith Country Club. I said, I want to play where you started, even though it's not the same course, it's a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. But he says, okay. Well, he's using my clubs. And his first drive in 40 years, he topped the ball and goes bouncing down the fairway. And he, he's mad, <laughs> but not like he used to be. And so mother hit the ball and I hit a ball. He just went down and he clubbed the ball all the way down, one hand and all the way to the green in the cup. On the second hole, it's it's 250 50 or 60 yards, 263, I think. And my dad's 80 years something years old, and he we said, "Go ahead and tee off, Dad." And there was some people up on the green putting. Well, we're not going to get to the green that that we're going to hit sharp and everything. My dad hit the ball and lands in the middle of the green and rolls right past these people. And they're all looking around <laughs> and there's this old white headed man down there just hit the ball. And they're looking all over trying, where did he come from? He can't hit the ball that far. My mother and I are sitting there with a mouse hanging open. He just hit the ball 260 something yards and look, he's 80 something years old. Wow. And he hadn't even swung a golf club in 40 years. And my mother says, 
I've often wondered what would have happened if he'd ever stayed with God, you know, after that. And I says, yeah, that's amazing. So we that was our one time all three of us got to play together. And that was one last yeah, round. But new, that, was a, time. that was an amazing thing, what he accomplished, you know, and for an 80-something-year-old man yeah. to hit a ball 264 yards and accurate enough to hit the middle of the green. <laughs> Wow. And we, we couldn't believe it. But that that was uh, an amazing experience. I guess that's about all on Fort Smith Country Club I can think of. Those are great stories, Dustin. Just the history and your own stories. and It's a lot of fun to listen to you. It's, uh, I enjoy talking about it because I've been, I'm so fortunate. The, the things I have and the people I have been around because of, uh, golf okay i worked with lee trevino and charlie jones done some charity events and i'm working with mickey mantle i'm working with all these famous baseball players Stan usual and everything at the hall of fame baseball golf tournament and uh, uh it's just amazing some of the the people and Stan usual uh to me was the most impressive baseball player as being a real great person. And what really, I'd heard nothing but good things about him. I always admired him. When I was a kid, listened to him on the radio. They were playing baseball. We were at the uh, uh, tournament, and uh, we I had my display there. I had 25 showcases of antiques of golf. And so we were loading all this in our, to our uh, semi, getting ready to leave the, the place and Stan Musial comes out and they have a limousine to take him to the airport and some of the other guys and they're all getting in the limousine and I had this guy helping from the lodge there was helping load our truck and he says is that Stan Musial getting in there and I says yes it is he says I've been trying to see him all week and I haven't been able to ever catch him and he said when I was a little boy, I rode the bus from Joplin, Missouri, over to St. Louis just to watch him play baseball. I says, get over there and talk. He says, they're already in the limo. I says, the door's still open, the truck's still open, they're still up. Get over there and talk to them. You'll never have another chance in your life. And he says, okay. So he goes over and Stan, he tells Mr. Musial, he tells him the story. And Stan gets out of the limo, and puts his arm around him, and he says, I want to shake his hand. He says, I want to thank, your, thank you and shake your hand, sir. If it hadn't been for people like you, I'd been nothing. Aww. And I thought, wow. That meant as much to him as yeah. it did to the man. He says, he okay, you have, a, you have any baseball cards or anything I can sign? He says, no. He says, okay. He pulls out one of his cards, and he says, what's your name? He says, Bob. To Bob, thanks for being such a great fan. I appreciate it deeply. Hands it to him. Bob comes back in his <laughs> trance. He says, look at that, look at that. I says, I got one thing to say to you. Do not let your kids touch that card. <laughs> All they'll think of, I can sell this for five bucks and get something to eat or buy something down there. I says, put that, mount that in the frame, hang it up. When you die, let them inherit it. It will mean something. True. And yeah. that's that was the deal. But I thought, man, that, that proved to me, you know, he had what kind of person he really was. And then I listened to him. And he's a harmonica player. I don't know where you knew that. Huh. But he entertained us at night. And they had one of the baseball players play the piano. Another one uh, played the saxophone. They brought him, and Musials played the uh, harmonica. And they would entertain us every night right out in the lobby where my exhibit was. And uh, they would uh, get played till 11, 12 o'clock at night. And wow. I, I was really impressed. He was a good musician too. But uh, and meeting people like that, and uh, uh, I met three of the presidents, got to know one of them, pointed me to a thing one time. but. Uh, uh, I guess uh, we're recording this? Yeah.
whatever you want. Well, but we anyway, to... I'm just talking. We can cut anything you okay. want us to cut. Okay, well, I, I was just telling you a little bit of uh, some of my experiences and some of the deals. I'm going to tell you one about, uh, I don't know where I told you this when I was talking about the rodeo, uh, about Rex Allen. Did I, do you recall anything about Rex Allen? Okay, Rex Allen Sr. was a right. great voice. And he, he uh, did some movies for Walt Disney and narrated some of the things. And I was at San Francisco Cow Palace Rodeo and we were loading the chutes up. And they had a 50 piece orchestra because they had a combination of rodeo and horse show. They'd have rodeo men and they'd have jumpers go around and everything. It was really a, a well organized and really well run program. And we weren't too excited about the horse show bit, but that's <laughs> that was educational for us guys too. But Rex was performing there, and I, the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. He went out into the arena, no guitar, just a microphone. They threw a spotlight on him, and we had the horses coming into the chutes to put the saddles on, and they're all getting in there and they're moving around nervous everything and all stirred up turn all the lights out and there's that spotlight on the end and he started singing Streets of Laredo without any accompaniment into the first verse he went through that before the orchestra hit him oh, boy. and we all were amazed all of us standing on shoots we were looking at we looked at the horses and the horses all froze they would not move they were just backed up against the fence and their eyes were real big and they were looking right straight at him at that spotlight and listening to his voice. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I've never seen it like that. Every horse in the chute was totally still. You could hear a pin drop back there. And that was really unusual around the chutes. And everybody standing on the chutes was really still watching. Couldn't believe it. And so after he performed, he come back up, and I went over and talked to him. I said, have you got that on record? He says, yeah, it's just on a 45, but says that's an old one. I, I don't know where they're available. So I went to the music store in San Francisco and see if I could find it. I says, I'll give you $25 for one. And of course they sold for 98 cents. I, back was there. Like, what? <laughs> I wanted that record bad after that experience. So. That was something, uh, one of the most unique experiences in my rodeo days that I can think of. Wow, and, uh, that's something. So, anyway, okay, this is a bank from about 1917. Uh, this is a driver that was given to my father by the golf pro John Gatherum at Fort Smith Country Club where he started caddy. And this is the call of nibbling. This huge thing is uh, really amazing. It's so big, they had a nickname, the frying pan, <laughs> was what they used to call it. But these are rare clubs. And then this is the putter my father set the course records with at five different golf courses in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And really, one of the guys that uh, got to see him was the late Bill Mosley, he was almost with Dad everywhere they went, they played, and he saw most of the action that uh, involved these titles and told me the stories because my dad never told them to me. Oh. These are uh, some of the clubs from my exhibit. So I ended up with cancer and had to sell the whole collection. And what, I'm gonna sit down. What sure. was amazing to me, Ben Hogan, and Byron Nelson are, were big names in golf. And Byron, I was uh, uh, at, I was uh, at, with him at the uh, uh, induction of the uh, Golf Hall of Fame, and I was speaking, and uh, at one of the, on one of the people going into the Hall of Fame for them, and I was sitting with Byron. He knew my dad, and, and uh, he knew F. W. Creek more than all rolling knows. Mm -hmm. Too. And uh, it was uh, just amazing to be able to talk to these people and 
they'd tell you stories you'd never heard. But Bill Mosley used to uh, visit with him quite a bit in later years. And after, I don't know where he'd retired from his abstract company or by then or what, but I'd go by his house, see him out in the yard, and I'd wheel in because uh, I passed his house all, almost every day. I lived in the neighborhood and uh, really got to uh, visit with him, but he saw some amazing things. And one of the places he set the course record was over at Poto. And they just opened the golf course a uh, short time before. And he was going over to uh, play with, with Bill and some others. And said, so Dad got over there and he played the first nine holes with a three on every hole. And nine holes in three, so that would be 27. And the course record was up in the 30s. And so it, the word got out among the golfers, and they were calling people, and people were running out to the golf course at Poto to watch the second round. And they were making bets that he could do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and so he did the first four holes at three, and then uh, had a par five, and he only got a four on it on the last uh, round and that broke the, the string of three but said that was that was unreal to watch what he would do at times so that's I had to depend on Bill to learn about my dad. I think that's fun to learn stories like that about your parents because yeah. for some reason yeah they don't always tell them to you but yeah that's uh, that's right uh, I don't know I just had the uh, had fun and meet people, and of course I was involved with, uh, met a lot of the movie people, you know, and uh, met Bob Hope and John Wayne and those people. I was using Palm Springs as my headquarters when I was riding in rodeos on the West Coast, and there was all these people coming in there. Natalie Wood, that was one I really remembered. <laughs> she was the rodeo queen in Palm Springs Rodeo that one year. She was still in her teens then. I thought she was one of the prettiest women I can remember in Hollywood. But well, here's here's a picture I like. Mm -hmm. I did this. I designed a golf course for myself over in Oklahoma, a par three type thing. And this is in hey, Huh? The one in Walter? No. No. I was living uh, uh, at Pacola. Oh, okay. And I had back my backyard was four or five acres, and I made me a par three course and I wear my stuff out. This was when we did, uh, did you know they did a live television show from my home? No. Over there? Mm -hmm. uh, Fox Channel did an hour long live television show from my home featuring my collection of golf stuff and then I dressed like this for it and I put their in, the guy that was doing the show and MC in the show, I got him and, and Nickers and everything we went out and hit some golf balls out there. And what's real comical, uh, the people over there didn't know what the heck's going <laughs> on. And we had a cop car come by. We were, were out in the country away from town a little ways. Uh, but uh, they saw all these trucks and they come out of Tulsa with their television equipment and their satellite trucks and all that. And here's these big trucks coming through for color and they turned down and side street and I said, whoa, what's going on here? And the cops followed, they were what? And they didn't know what was going on in our place. And one of the neighbor kids told them, one of the kids says, you better not mess around there. They got a lot of guns out there. <laughs> <laughs> and they, the cops always look leery at us whenever they go by. But anyway, here's this big truck and there's cables running out, big cameras set up in the, and we run through the living room door is cables and cameras sitting in there, cameras outside. And, and another truckload of stuff with the power generators and crews all over the place. <laughs> Our yard really looks like there, cable there, cable there, big old cables about that big running all over. And the people in the neighborhood are all looking. None of them picked up that channel, so they didn't know anything oh. about it. <laughs> and so I've got a video, I guess, uh, they filmed it and gave me a copy of, of the thing, but it's an hour long show featuring my golf collection 
and talking about God. So they play it during the masters or anything? I mean, was it? No, uh, it was shown in not, just just another time. Yeah. Uh, I did a the PGA show. They they uh, I did a, a radio show for them, and what was amazing, they made it, uh, uh, arrangements to call me on the phone to do an interview oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and everything from the PGA TV show. And they were just going to show some pictures, you know, talk with me about my collection, I guess is what that was. I don't remember. But anyway, my father-in-law had had a heart attack, and I was at Conway at the hospital, and I had to call him at Tulsa and tell him, hey, uh, things are changed. I'm not going to be at home. I'm going to be at, at the hospital in Conway. Here's the telephone number. Call this number. They're going to give me a separate room to set up, and we'll do the interview. Oh, my goodness. And so the hospital put me in a conference room, and they uh, funneled the call in to me whenever they came in. And they couldn't believe it. Good, <laughs> good, uh, a live show from the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> they, but that was I'm not fun. sure they do that now. No, but uh, that uh, that was fun uh, doing.